This excerpt was taken from a Full and Bloom interview with Doug Marks. You can listen to the entire interview at fullandbloom.com. Click the link below. You start your teaching career in Denver, and I read that you were in touring bands while you're in well, Denver. Hey. Before Denver, I played out of the southeast, uh, particularly Atlanta, Florida, and that area. The vacation traffic down in Florida. I would play six to seven nights a week, but it, it was at the time, mid-70s, and it was cover bands. Okay. After that, I, I moved to Denver. I didn't play at all when I was in Denver, but I did start teaching private guitar instruction in Denver. Uh, however, I had not given up the dream, and my wife and I decided, let's move to Hollywood. Beverly Hills, swimming pools, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Pursued the dream. And when I came out here, I found that the dream was pretty hard to pursue. I mean, I realized, you know, I wasn't naive. I was almost 30 at the time. So, you know, I, I wasn't stupid or anything. And I was, uh, I had my head on straight. But when I got out here, the whole thing was much different than expected. It wasn't a matter of I didn't have the talent or the ability or the look or the, any of the other things. There was so much crap out here to sort through. I, I'd go for an audition. Nobody knew who I was. And it'd just be a, a band that would never go anywhere because the quality of the people that I was coming across were not very good. They were not good players. They were mostly amateurs. They had never actually played in any kind of professional bands at all. And so I decided I'd better get back to uh, doing the guitar lessons. And uh, that evolved into metal method very quickly. I mean, I moved out here in 81 and, uh, and in 82, I started metal method. And then by 85, metal method was so successful that I felt that I could pursue my dream. And that's when I did Hawk. And I had actually accumulated about $80,000 that I was able to spend promoting the band, housing the band, paying for rehearsals, the whole thing. I was covering all expenses, and I went through the entire $80,000. <laughs> and at the other end of it, because there were problems with the band, the guys were younger than me, it was very difficult to manage, there was alcohol and drug problems, and so I went back to Metal Method. And back then, 80000 went a lot further. I mean, that was a lot of money. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, even with Metal Method, when I started Metal Method, I had absolutely nothing. I had just been kicking around. and I mean, I had a couple of guitars and no wealth, no job, nothing. But within a year and a half, I was making over $100,000 a year. So it was a real rag to riches. Uh, but as time has evolved, at this point in time, because there is less demand, for type of lessons that I do and so on and so forth, and there's so much competition that I don't make much more than a regular instructor does right now, if even that. I'm assuming you had been to L.A. prior to moving there, though, Never. right? No. You just moved without, did you move? <laughs> well, it started, uh, uh, my ex-wife had a job in Atlanta, and I didn't. Uh, when I, I left the band that I was in there, the, the band that was doing the traveling around, playing in Florida and such, and uh, she got an offer to move to Denver. She was uh, painting, hand-painting lamps, and uh, the company wanted her to move out to the headquarters in Denver, and so they moved us out there, and after we were uh, in Denver for a couple of years, and as I said, that's where I started giving some guitar lessons, they laid her off, so neither one of us were really working to speak of. We rented a truck, I had a VW, we uh, tied the VW on the back, trailer hitched it or whatever, and uh, drove to California, not knowing anybody aside from an aunt and uncle that I had out here. Didn't know anybody. But at the same time, I'm originally from West Virginia. When I moved to Atlanta with my ex-wife, we moved to Atlanta, did not know a single soul the day we got there. We met somebody, and they said, hey, uh, you can come over and spend a night at our house. I mean, that's <laughs> that was a long time ago. But, yeah, that, for the uh, decade from when I was 20 to 30 years old, I didn't have, uh, as my mom would say, a pot to piss in. So do you move in with your aunt and uncle, or you, do you guys get your no. own place? Got our own place. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, aunt and uncle lived in Orange County, and that's, We've, uh, it's 
an hour and a half drive from where we decided to settle. We wanted to be reasonably close to the Hollywood area and all that stuff because of my rock and roll dream. Right. So we settled in, in, in Van Nuys, and uh, while in Van Nuys, that's when I started doing the Metal Method thing. And uh, very quickly moved to a, a nice home, uh, probably a nice car. It was like within, uh, within a year, a year you're in a house. Just, Sorry, go ahead. Well, well it, it was a rental house at the time. I didn't have a house, didn't actually have a house until that we paid, you know, was our own until 86. So that would have been right after Hawk. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, when I was in Hawk, we were driving a brand new XJS Jaguar, you know, going to the Rainbow, hanging out, and I'm sure that that caused a lot of competition. People would look at me and go, "Man, I got to do what that guy's doing. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing something right." There was this guy that I used to work with in Texas, and he was in a band that kind of made a little stink there, and went over to LA and. Uh, like was being courted by, I guess, a manager that had managed Quiet Riot. I just remember him telling me a story that all these guys from different bands that had been in national acts were coming together to do a band. And I guess you were in there, but everybody's driving up in their broken down cars and you drive up in your Jaguar. <laughs> Did you form or almost form any other projects after Hawk? Uh, not well, okay. The original Hawk broke up, and uh, that was, I believe, like in January 86, and then I spent the rest of the year working on my Hawk album, recording my Hawk album, and I did audition players for the second version of Hawk. We auditioned, we uh, went to the recording, uh, well, the rehearsal studios, SIR, in Hollywood. We rehearsed, but... Once again, you know, I looked at it and it's like, mm, this is not, uh, this is not what I wanted, and I, um, I wasn't willing to throw good money after bad. Is basically what it was at that point. So I just gave up on that project too. So in that second one, are there some guys from? Uh, there were some notable players. Nobody particularly comes to mind, but. Uh, there, I know one of the drummers that we auditioned went on to play with the Bullet Boys, and I, I auditioned a lot of people, so sure, I would say that the story was legitimate. It's funny with your connection with all the Bullet Boys. Well, uh, I don't know if you know the story, but Lonnie, the bass player for the... Okay. Since I don't know whether you know the story or not, I'll, I'll quickly... Oh, please. And on the details. Yeah, please tell. Okay, so my bass player was Lonnie Miller. That when Hot disbanded, Lonnie went to King Cobra and then uh, from King Cobra to the Bullet Boys. Now, I left the band, uh, I left Hawk, my own band, and uh, they went out using the name New Hawk for a while, which of course, pissed me off. So we weren't on good terms at that particular time, but they needed a guitar player. So uh, Mark, I forget how to pronounce his name, Torian or Torian something like that. Or Torian, yeah. yeah. Torian. Mark took my place. Mark's an excellent guitar player and singer. And so after King Cobra, Lonnie knew Mark. Obviously, they played together in the, the uh, new hot version of the band. And so uh, he and Mark put together the Bullet Boys. And also, the original group Hawk had a, a very good drummer by the name of Glenn Burtis. But we had information out there, audition information, that even though our band was together and we were rehearsing, that information was still out there because I put it out through Metal Method and everything. So it's not like, okay, we found the drummer and all that. Yeah, it doesn't quite work like that. A lot of people didn't know. So we got an audition tape from Scott Travis, and Scott Travis was the drummer we had was as good musically, as good as a musician as the rest of us. But Scott Travis was just amazing. And uh, as you may or may not know, he went on to play with Judas Priest. Uh, and Racer well, X. first Racer X, yeah. and then, 
than Judas Priest, and he's still associated with them 35 years later. So that kind of clears up one of my questions. When Mark came in, I thought, well, that's weird that Mark replaced you, but then I read somewhere Charlie had said that Mark was phenomenal. He was like a, an Eddie Van Halen clone. Absolutely. He really had Eddie Van Halen stuff down. Awesome guitar player. Uh, awesome singer. I thought that was weird that they would have continued on something that you funded. I'm assuming when you funded Hawk, you're basically a record label to the band. Do you right. pay them salaries and stuff like that, or, or how did that work? They were paid... Uh, I, I, I had a band house that they could live in, which was basically an apartment. They all lived in the apartment. Ronnie lived with me quite a bit. Uh, actually, he never lived in an apartment, come to think of it. He lived with me. And that's when things started to fall apart. I was giving someone the, the money to give to the landlord in late 85. Instead of giving the money to pay the rent, a person in the band decided it'd be a good idea to buy Christmas presents for everybody. That was the type of thing that I was dealing with, and it was like, you know what, I just can't do this anymore. And so one thing led to another, and it was like, I just packed up my stuff and said, sorry guys, I'm not willing to do this anymore. At the same time, what were they going to do? They were going to continue to do the same thing they did. You know, I can't tell them, do not play together. So they played together, and uh, they decided to call themselves New Hawk, as I said before. And they were taking out ads in uh, the major local magazines and everything, and I had paid a lot of money for advertising, and I went to the magazines and said, look, guys, these guys are not Hawk. You know that I'm Hawk, and you know the name belongs to me. And there's going to be trouble if you keep accepting advertising dollars from them. And anyway, I, I don't really know exactly what went down, but I decided I really didn't want someone using the name of the band that I spent all that money on. And, you know, it belonged to me. And, uh, and so I did what I could to make sure that it didn't continue to happen, and it didn't. At the same time, I don't know that I'm on bad terms with anybody that played in the band. And did they just break up soon after? Yeah, fairly soon. I don't know, maybe a couple months. And that's when uh, Scott Travis, the drummer, he was being courted by Racer X. Even when I was playing in the band, I learned later. Amani very quickly got in King Cobra, and then uh, Carmine had the same I know Carmine, and, and we've talked about things, but he had a, a difficult time with Lonnie, and then Lonnie moved on and did very, very well with the Bullet Boys. And Mark was in King Cobra, you know, at that tail end as well. Ah, good point. Two. 